Um, thanks very much for having me here today. So today, as James outlined, I'm presenting um, some of my PhD work, work, which I completed with the National Centre for, for Primary Core Economics in Ireland and Trinity College Dublin. So just a bit of background. Um, at the start of this project, um, I was a beginner OR user. So at, and now at the end of it, I like to think I'm an intermediate OR user now after the project. Um, so just give you an outline of my presentation today. Um, first, I'm going to out give you some of the background and aim of the project. I'm going to outline how I adapted um, the, um, the cardiovascular model by Zari et al. Um, the results of my analysis and some of my observations about um, using OR for um, the first time in economic modelling. Um, so um, atherosclerosis is the buildup of fat and cholesterol and other substances in your arteries. The plaque can build up restricting blood flow or it can burst causing a blood clot and lead to an acute cardiovascular event. The disease can be classified into coronary, depending on where the events occur. And secondary prevention refers to, refers to the prevention of events in patients who have already been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, while primary prevention refers to prevention in those who have no history of cardiovascular disease. So in 2015, um, PCSK9 inhibitors emerged as a new class of therapy. And two have been licensed to date, Evrilocumab and Alarocumab. So they work by binding to PCSK9 proteins in the blood, preventing the PCSK9-led degradation of LDLC receptors. And this results in um, serum LDLC reductions of approximately 60%. And cardiovascular outcomes trials published in 2017 and 2018 showed a reduction in non-fatal cardiovascular events, but no difference in cardiovascular mortality was observed. So with a large eligible patient population, and an annual drug cost of around 8,000 euro per patient per year, including VAT, unlimited use could lead to an unsustainable um, budget impact. Uh, but there's also further complexity when there's significant heterogeneity in the licensed population. And this means that there are differences in the demographic or clinical characteristics across the population. And this can lead to clinical heterogeneity where the relative and absolute benefit of PCS can inhibitors varies across the licensed population and or economic heterogeneity where there are differences in expected cost effectiveness. But if we can identify subgroups of the population in whom the intervention is cost effective, population um, health can be improved by reimbursing the drug in the subgroups of the population in whom it is cost effective, rather than reimbursing the, dr um, the drug um, in the total population and none at all. So in Ireland, Following two HTAs, Evilacumab was found not to be cost effective at the list price. However, following price negotiations, it was um, reimbursed subject to a strict reimbursement application system. And criteria include LDLC thresholds and history of MI or bypass. And Alarocumab was also recently uh, reimbursed as well. But in the economic evaluations published in the literature to date, there was limited consideration of heterogeneity in terms of LDLC level and there was Consideration of heterogeneity in terms of LDLC level and age, but with limited consideration in terms of how cost effectiveness varies across cardiovascular history and other risk factors. Therefore, the aim of the thesis was to um, quantify the cost effectiveness in the secondary prevention population in Ireland and to examine how it varies across subgroups. So, in order to conduct the economic evaluation, we need to build an economic model and populate it with relevant parameters. So at the start of this project, I was used to building um, models in, in Excel. And originally that was the, um, the software package I was, I was planning to use considering it's most flexible. I had most experience in it and I'd previously received training in it. Um, but the evaluation is more complex than the ones I've conducted previously. A difference in colours in this graph reflect that parameters vary across the population because of heterogeneity. And given our interest in heterogeneity, it's not sufficient to just simply to derive mean population parameters. We need to understand how these parameters vary across the model population. And one of the most important parameters in the model 
is a baseline risk of cardiovascular events. But given the limited use of electronic health records in Ireland, there was no data set which would contain all the data I required and the ability to adjust the baseline risk by the cardiovascular risk factors. Therefore, we had to um, look to UK data. Um, so the Calibre data set uh, followed over 94,000 patients with um, coronary artery disease um, for um, which about five years, about median duration of five years. And it includes primary care, hospital data and national mortality data. So while the raw data isn't open access, in 2016, Asari et al published an open access coronary artery disease model in OR based on this data. Um, so the risk, the raw patient data isn't published, but the risk equations derived from this data are. And therefore, given the strength of this analysis with the commission of the author, I decided to adapt this model um, for my PhD thesis. Um, but um, all of the data um, that, I, that I use in my thesis are already in the public domain. So was, given it was built in OR, it was daunting at first, given I'm not a statistician and I only previously built models in OR. But so was part of the neighbors that helped me to, um, to work with OR was the fact that the quality of the code structure and the, the comments to the user that was in the code by Zari et al. Um, and support from statistician members of the NCP team. And basically just going through the, each line code, making sure I understood every function and Google was a help as well in making sure I understood all the, uh, the functions and the OR code as well. So uh, just the basic model structure is presented here. So it's a multi-state model, which is a type of state transition model, which accounts for competing risk of event, events and time varying hazards. So the multi-state doesn't refer to the fact that there's a more than one health state. It means multi-state describes models where there are transitions between states that are modeled in continuous time, in contrast to most traditional state transition models um, where um, transition probabilities, probabilities are modeled for discrete time points. So in this model, there are tunnel states corresponding uh, to each non-fatal um, event, um, um, which is used to account for how long since an event occurred. So when these are included, there are over 852 health states in the model. And this highlights one of the advantages of working in OR in that it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to build this type of model in Excel. So the baseline risk of each of the 11 transitions was measured using um, um, parametric survival distributions by Zari et al. And extrapolation was required given the long time horizon of the model. And this table just outlines how um, the effect of um, covariates um, on each of, of the hazards and the strength of this analysis by, by the number of covariates included. So this, it's the effect of covariates was incorporated using the accelerator failure time models, which means if the median cost specific survival was Y years, um, the, the median cost specific for survival for someone with the risk, risk factor is multiplied by, um, by the risk factors here. So coefficients less than one represent um, factors which increase the rate of the event. So for example, here in this analysis, if the median cost specific survival was um, Y years, um, the, the, the median um, survival for a woman versus a man is, is 1.44 times longer. So as Ariat Al's model just dealt with people with coronary artery disease, so I adjusted his baseline risk data for patients with a history of cerebrovascular disease only using risk factors from the literature. Um, so then looking at the, pop uh, the population data. So Azaria used pop the original um, population data from Calibre, which included 94,000 patients in Tilda. But ideally, for my analysis, I wanted to use Irish data. So TILDA, or the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, is recognised internationally for the breadth of, of physical, mental health and cognitive measures collected. And together with the extensive social and economic data collected, it makes it one of its um, comprehensive of its kind um, internationally, nationally, 
and detailed data is collected on history of cardiovascular disease and biomarkers such as LDLC. Therefore, um, I use this data set to um, derive the population characteristics for the study. And, and where we didn't have data from TILDA, we used the, the mean population characteristics from the caliber population. Um, and then while, well, as Ari et al for his analysis, he analyzed the population um, by breaking the, the population into risk deciles. For example, patients with 10% risk of events and 20% risk of events. That's difficult in a decision-making context. So when I was dividing my subgroups, it was based on history of cardiovascular disease and other risk factors. So then looking at um, utilities. So Asari et al um, used um, um, utilities from Sullivan et al, um, which is a catalog of EQ5D scores for the United Kingdom, it was actually based on population uh, measures from an American population and there's limited capture of um, chronic conditions. Therefore, in a separate body of work in my, th my thesis, I developed a mapping algorithm from data in TILDA and to EQ5D, and I um, adapted the model to include these utilities in um, the analysis and also change the structure slightly. So whereas the Zaria model use um, utilities additively, I use um, in some analysis, I use utility multipliers. And as I had um, access to the patient level data in TILDA, we could compute utility values for patients with a history of more than one event by taking the mean of the population rather than trying to uh, adjust summary utility values from the literature. So each of the columns here represents the mean utility for a different subgroup. For example, for my analysis of TILDA, the utility for patients with a history of MI, TIA, or stroke was 0.78. And as expected, the mean utility value, predicted utility value for patients with a history of more than one stroke was 0.55. It was also low for patients with a history of diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease with a utility value of 0.62. An advantage of TILDA as well is that we also had data on patients with history of more than one event. So for example, from our analysis, we showed that history of um, the utility decrement for um, patients with history of more than one MI is, is almost twice that of a single MI and similar relationship was observed for stroke. And then finally, um, looking at the relative efficacy, Sari et al. looked at um, hypothetical interventions and effects in his model. So for my analysis, um, I conducted a systematic review, examining the relative efficacy of PCSK9 in, uh, um, inhibitors on cardiovascular outcomes. So we, um, um, where we found that, there was, that they did reduce the time to non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke, um, that there was um, no effect on cardiovascular death or hemorrhagic stroke, and we didn't find that these parameters changed. There was no difference in relative efficacy by cardiovascular history or based on LDLC. Um, so if you, you can also apply the treatment effect by um, looking at true data, surrogate endpoint of LDLC, in addition to uh, applying treatment effects directly. And we identified evidence that the extent of LDLC reduction depends on the baseline LDLC. And then we used, um, we updated Azari et al's analysis um, for Irish costs where possible. Um, so in Azari et al's model, um, they had, um, uh, they conducted a, a regression analysis of the caliber, caliber data, where they're able to capture the heterogeneity in costs um, across the population. So for example, for if a patient with unstable angina, the cost per 90 day cycle was 175 euro higher. And for those with history of atrial fibrillation, it was 307 euro higher, and so on. So then looking at the results, and the base case was conducted at a baseline LDLC of four millimole per liter in a cardiovascular population with, uh, with history of MI, TIA, heart attack, or stroke. And the estimated item was 2.3 million euro per quality. A large amount of uncertainty can be observed in the broad 
broad cloud of simulations, which is primarily driven by uncertainty in the cardiovascular mortality treatment effects. And we also looked at cost effectiveness across subgroups of the population. So the deterministic analysis here, um, the, the, um, the ice, we found an ice of 1.6 million euro per quality. And we look at in groups with um, higher risk of cardiovascular disease, for example, recurrent events, for example, INAMI, ISO is still very high at 1.2 million euro per quality. Or for patients with um, at, um, for patients with disease in two cardiovascular beds, ISO is um, 0.86 million euro per quality. And even when you conduct this analysis using a surrogate endpoint of LDLC, um, you under different assumptions, the ICE are still far exceeded traditional cost effectiveness thresholds. So I just suppose so, some um, observations after um, completing the work in OR. I think the work shows the advantage of OR in handling the greater complexity associated with the model in capturing time varying competing risks and the ability to capture heterogeneity and identify sub, potentially identify subgroups of the population in whom the intervention is cost effective. And so another advantage of OR is that, this, that it's easy to facilitate the sharing of existing high quality models. And I propose that um, it might be a way to incentivize some people to improve to OR in that it lowers the, the training hurdle and can incentivize OR uptake. And like, for example, now I'd be much more inclined to use OR in building other economics and economic models from scratch in the future, given that um, I have that experience now of adapting um, a previous model in OR. I'd just like to thank um, all the staff in the NC, in, uh, NCPE for helping with, me with analysis and Dr. Mikda Azaria for allowing me to adapt the model for my thesis. So that's my email address if anyone has any questions, but thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Helen. Um, I'm just going to go <coughs> uh, to the questions. Um, Howard, do you want to ask the question directly there? Yeah, sure. Helen, thanks very much for sharing this experience. It's interesting to see the, the other end because we develop a lot of models, make them open source, but we don't always know what happens to them afterwards. Um, is there anything you could recommend to us to make our models more accessible to people wanting to make adaptations, like was Asaria's a consistent coding style, lots of detailed comments, vignettes, like well, what was the most helpful thing? Um, it was the quality of the code structure was important, the way the functions were laid out, it was laid out very well for someone to be able to follow that structure. I suppose um, like good comments is key, like most of it was very well commented, but there was, there was always the odd section where it did take some digging out to figure out, okay, what did he, what did he mean here? But I suppose, I suppose it, it, it's like I, I wouldn't have been able to like I suppose it, their model was a hypothetical model. I suppose it's great to be able to translate that to um, an actual disease area as well. As to point, and I said that the ICERs are like the model was more complex than other models in the literature I've observed in the area, and it captures more of the heterogeneity and the complexity and the risks. I, the ICERs in, in our analysis were not that higher than other analysis in the literature as well, which will, obviously there could be numerous reasons for that, but potentially it could be the fact that that complexity wasn't captured appropriately. Helen, I wanted to ask a related question. I think it's very difficult to adapt somebody else's work if you haven't understood the conceptual flow, if you haven't been there when they've developed it from the beginning. Having read through the model, do you think that you would write it in the same way after you knew what the model does, if you were coming to from scratch, or do you think that reading the model sets too much a sense of dependency and it's difficult to reconceptualize the, the, the model? I think it's difficult, it would be difficult for me to reconceptualize the model because that's what I, I got so used to thinking of it in that way, but it's hard for me to think starting from scratch again. I think it would have followed a lot of the same parameters because it was laid out so well in the beginning, I think it'd be difficult to change that. But like, I'm not an expert, I'm not a statistician, I'm not an expert in or maybe someone else would see, would see better ways to run it. And can I ask, has there, have there been any requests to pass the model on again or to pass it back in the 
in the kind of more applied form because at that point once you've made adaptations you are then maybe the point of contact and instruction for for, for somebody else the baton has been passed and um, well i haven't had any requests but i i plan to put the model up on github and i'm happy like to or any requests or to adapt it further super okay do we have any other comments i uh, do anybody want to throw a question into the chat uh, the work is being a uh, um, praised in the in the chat from Raymond Henderson is great work. Do we have anybody else coming forward with a question? Super. Okay. Well, uh, without further ado, then thanks very much, Helen. And then um, we might uh, move on.